Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast interview here with Dan Bigham, who, well, his first appearance, I'm joking, obviously not, but great to have you here, Dan, and uh, it's been a very eventful year last year, and we're going to talk plenty about that, and I'm even going to venture into some tech stuff as well. Um, but yeah, 2022, how was it for you overall? Yeah, th- firstly, yeah, thanks for having me back for the 50th time. <laughs> love a chat, love a podcast um yeah 2022 it was i was actually thinking about this on the turbo yesterday about how the hell you step up on what a year that was not that at the start of the year i was like this is gonna be amazing to do all this stuff but then you look back and you're like okay got married got a baby on the way broke the hour record and won the world champs in team suit i was like that's pretty fucking cool it's a good year <laughs> and i was like i did not anticipate that did not plan to try and tick all those boxes and it just kind of all came together and made a pretty epic year <laughs> that I don't think I'm going to top. So, well, we can't not mention the hour record, as you just said. Um, you had the British hour record. The big goal was the world hour record. How was it leading up to that event? You were so close in Gretchen uh, the year before, but what kind of change to just get those last few meters or what um last few meters <laughs> the, the extra 800 that i found yeah that's <laughs> less than a kilometer all right 800 that's not no eight what's that like five percent drag reduction something like that big big gains eight yeah 800 so how did you do it 16 watts uh a lot of different things really i'm trying to remember back to it because it's actually when did i do it august yeah so it's been like five months now and uh, yeah, you kind of, everything amalgamates into one big memory and you kind of start to forget some of the details. But I think the improvements probably, Kate, well, you can split it in down the middle of energy in, energy out. And I know I've always talked about that as a concept, but the energy outside's always been where my passion lies, my interests, the technology, the application of maths and physics and science to make you go faster for no more energy. And I pushed that and pushed that and I definitely made improvements. I team, we collectively made improvements within the Oscar and Adiz, Bioracer, Cask, obviously Pinarello, Princeton, um, all coming together on what was a pretty awesome project. Muckoff actually as well, made some good improvements there. Let's not forget them. But um, I think that probably only attributed for around 50% of my improvements. Sorry, call that about 400 meters. So the other 400 meters would come basically from physiology, eight watts improvement, which doesn't sound a huge amount, but trying to find eight watts on what is literally your threshold is pretty hard work. And a lot of that really didn't come from like raising the ceiling as it were. So trying to get fitter as an athlete, it was more about trying to achieve what I was capable of doing, but making the environment more conducive to less drag and performing in that environment. So having it warmer, having it more humid is good for air density reduction, which means more speed for a given amount of power, but it also significantly reduces your cooling capacity. So how much you can cool is a function of how much water is already in the air, humidity, and how hot it is. So that comes down to basically doing a lot of training to adapt your body to sweat more and to physiologically deal in the heat, but then also the preparations beforehand to get your core temp as low as it possibly can before you start, which is a super interesting project. And I, I talked about it quite a bit because for me, the physiology side's always been a bit kind of boring and frustrating because it's just kind of this black box of you apply a stimulus of riding your bike and maybe you get faster or maybe you don't. Whereas the physiology side of, of thermal, the thermal dynamics was really quite tangible and quite objective. So you can, we collectively with, with Core, with Green Tech, we built this really cool model where you can tie in all the variables. So like, what, what's the solar load from the lighting? How big is your body mass? What is your... Uh, gross efficiency, uh, otherwise obviously the atmospherics and all these different inputs you can put in and it's like, okay, you can under all these conditions with your current physiology, et cetera, et cetera, ride out this power. And then you try and tweak all of those. Can you lower your core temp a bit more? Can you raise the core temp that you can get to at the end and sustain it without exploding? Can you uh, achieve the same kind of growth efficiency with a change in yeah, the temperature, the humidity, et cetera? It was all, yeah, a fun way of... Um, playing with physiology and I normally get excited about the energy outside thing, but um, yeah, the energy in bit got me. And I think that, that was a massive improvement to be honest. My, I was putting out 
pretty much the same numbers, maybe a little bit better, but in uh, yeah, much more extreme environment. So is this something that, well, is it going to be, well, obviously the elephant in the room, Ghana, you were part of that record attempt as well. Was that something you applied to Ghana's preparation as well? Yeah, the entire project within Ineos Grenadiers was pretty much treated as like a sort of big R&D research project. What can we learn and what can we apply? And not just for Filippo's hour. Obviously, that that was like the end goal, like properly destroy the hour record. And I'm pretty, pretty confident you can say Filippo's done that. But also all of that knowledge stays within the team. It's not a case of, oh, it only applies to an hour record. We're riding bikes, whether it's indoors or outdoors, your physiology is still the same. And it's getting hotter. And get, pretty much any cyclist out there has realized the last few years, especially in the Tour de France, it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And thermal physiology is becoming more and more critical to performance. So the more we can understand about the physiology and how we can implement different things to our benefit, then the better we're going to perform in those extreme environments. So it was a really interesting project, not just to learn things actually as well, but to gain traction within the wider team that they understand the impact of, say, an ice slushy beforehand or um, other pre-cooling strategies or doing heat training and what that looks like so that they all buy into the process and suddenly the entire team is, is thinking about it and is trying to move this entire thing forward rather than a couple of people within performance support saying, hey, guys, you need to you need to have some ice slushies before, it, before you go out and race. So it was, it was really powerful for that. And obviously, yeah, Felipe used it to good effect as well. Uh, he he was he was in on that and yeah did quite a bit of heat training. Um, his sweating capacity was obviously he's a bigger guy than me, a little bit more than me. I think he lost two and a half kilos, something like that. It was two and a half, maybe in two point eight kilos over an entire hour. So quite a bit of sweat loss. And obviously that evaporates, and that's what cools you down. But so does it, do you think that this you're going to basically follow? Like obviously we know the a time trial is more intensive, but. Do you think this would be something you would apply to a road stage, the mountains, et cetera, like you said, with the Tour de France? Yeah, we're definitely starting to. Time trials tend to have more benefit because you tend to hit higher core temperatures in time trials. It's, uh, you can't cool yourself and maintain homeostasis. Basically, you will drift up and drift up until yeah, you start to negate that through putting out less power. So there was a really interesting study in uh, it was Qatar World 2016, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> there was an interesting study there where they got a lot of the riders doing time trial and road race to ingest a core temp pill so they could log all the data and all the highest core temp values were experienced in the time trial, not in the road race. So even though the road race is whatever it was, five, six, seven hours out in the baking sun, their core temp is a lot lower because they're not putting out as much power. It's so not having to dissipate as much heat. Whereas in the time trial, when you're riding at say 400 watts, if your efficiency is 20%, then you've got another 1,600 watts of energy to get rid of, or 1,600 watts of power, sorry, to get rid of. Whereas in a road race, if you're only riding at 200, 250, it's a, an order of, well, it's a significant amount less that you're trying to, to trying to dissipate, and you can manage it a whole lot better. You can't go and get ice slushies and drinks and things in a time trial, at least not very easily. Whereas in a road race, you can be strategic about how you get them and where you get them. So it's, it's definitely got a bigger impact in time trials, but it still drastically impacts in road race performance as well. Yeah, I was thinking that we we're going to talk about the front end aerodynamics and we're going down a whole other route. Uh, but going back to the <laughs> hour record, <laughs> going back to the hour record, how was it for you kind of, because it's been a project for you, gain, well, doing well at the hour record and then here you are, you have the world hour record. How was that? Was it just relief or was it just, uh, I'd say it was a, a whole lot of enjoyment. Like, I definitely was like stressed and nervous. I think anybody, that would be normal <laughs> before attempting the World Hour record. But I kind of been through the motions. Obviously, I'd been really close with Joss when she'd gone and done it and seen how she dealt with it. And to be honest, I felt the same kind of pressure when I went for the British Hour record. Not quite the same, but I mean, you were there as well and you saw it firsthand. It's, um, it's, it's quite a... a a ballsy thing to kind of put your hand up and go yeah I'm better than everybody I'm going to show you and on a specific day of your choosing with equipment of your entire choice you go and show them so you've got nowhere to hide which is quite a scary thought but back in June just after the sub seven sub eight triathlon team time trial thing that uh, we all did over in Germany I went over to Switzerland and we did a, a full dry run <clears throat> so dress rehearsal going through literally everything the same kind of warm-up same kind of pacing strategy 
trying to get everything as close as we can to what the actual event would be. And I broke Camping Arts record in training by 127 meters, which was, okay, tight. <laughs> That's by 127 meters is, well, not much, like two watts, just over. So real tight performance, but at the same time, really confidence inspiring to know you can go and do it. And that was on my old Argon before the improvements that we knew were bringing forward with the new Pinarello, the new Princeton di uh, disc wheels, etc. So I was quite confident going into it that it was wholly achievable as long as I executed, as long as I did what I knew I was capable of. So it was in my control and therefore I needed to, yeah, execute and stick to the plan, stick to the basic strategy throughout and make sure that I, I just do all I can and not, not fall apart, keep your head together. And it kind of got to the... Well, halfway, I had a bit of a wobble in my head. But then with about 10 or 15 minutes to go, I kind of knew, yeah, this is doable. And it's more a case of, well, how much can you push it? And I was just riding on the absolute limit to the to the line. I couldn't get any more out. Maybe a little bit in a few meters here or there with a better line. But on the whole, yeah, that was the best performance I'd, I'd put out. Um, just, yeah, maybe you could argue over two or three meters, but I don't think I had another 1.2 kilometers in me, that's for sure. So you wouldn't do it again? <laughs> Never say never. So now I'll do my best. Um, we know how well <coughs> of a tech expert you are, aerodynamics, now heat as well, but uh, thermodynamics. But uh, in terms of the bike that for the Ghana record, this humpback whale inspired uh, our record bike, what was kind of the recent, well, the new developments being brought back into it or like brought into it? Where did that come from? Funny enough, actually, myself and Filippo, we had the exact same bike. Not, sorry, not the actual one, but like all of it, I was on the same size. They were all printed, same features, just mine was hidden away and never really saw the light of day. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got I was the first to ride that bike uh, and test it and get some good data on it, which is a pretty cool experience riding around on a basically a 3D printed bike. It's quite, quite cool. Uh, the process itself began in... It was about March. It was a really tight timeline to the point where at first we were thinking, okay, we're not going to get a bike done in the time frame from March to August. It's just, it's way too intensive. Anybody who designs bikes or even builds bikes knows that the time scales of getting tooling made or molds and tooling and um, all the ISO testing it's got to go through plus the UCI approval. It's, yeah, it's, it's not feasible. So that kind of opened up the door of why don't we go down 3D printing rather than carbon composite because it, it basically gave us about a three or four week window to design and develop and test the bike, which is no, no small amount of effort. And it was um, a combination of a whole lot of very intelligent people coming together. Obviously, Pinarello have their own R&D department. Within Ineos Great Ideas, we have a number of different um, engineers and aerodynamicists. So Luca Giano, who's um, probably the smartest aerodynamicist nobody's really heard of in the sport he is the brains behind so many things in cycling and yet he hides in the shadows uh, and he's yeah he's an incredibly good guy and he led on a lot of the, the idea uh, and then also Dimitris uh, Dimitris Kassanis who I'm sure people know from Metron uh, they, well, they, they printed the frame uh, he had a lot of ideas as well and it was basically just meeting after meeting and design work design meetings and wind tunnel tests CFD tests uh, and just doing all we can to fast track the process. So the humpback whale inspiration. So we were looking at a lot of different concepts. Well, um, and the one thing that's really powerful with CFD is you can understand where your drag is coming from. And put simply, the vast majority of your drag on a frame, at least when it's very optimized, comes from seat post and seat tube. It's about 30, 40% off the top of my head. So when you've got most of your drag coming from that area, that's typically for a reason. And when you look at it, you're getting a lot of separation because what's happening is you, the seat post and seat tube are sitting between your legs. You're pedaling. And that means you've got a leg forward and a leg rearward and that oscillates and alternates. So what happens with the airflow is it comes between your legs and then changes direction. So it's, as you say, your left leg is forward and your right leg is rearward. Onset flow would then turn behind the back of your left leg, which means the onset flow angle onto the seat post and seat tube is not straight ahead. It can be anything up to sort of 40, 45 degrees. Now, any normal airfoil would separate at that kind of angle. By separation, I mean, um, you induce a lot of drag off 
the airfoil because the flow is no longer attached to it. So what you can do is you can do a lot of different things if you want. You can change the profile. You can make it really fat, rounded airfoil. Or what well, the route we went down was the tubercles. So the intention it was to basically control flow separation at high onset flow angles. That's what the original study was done on. Um, and yeah, it works really well in, in that scenario. Um, hence why it's only on the seat tube and seat post and not everywhere because your legs aren't between the four or down tube, the seat post sits right down the middle. Do you think this is something we're going to see introduced on bikes going forward now? <laughs> well, I hope it will be on all the Pinarello bikes pretty soon. So um, I think it will become more commonplace. Uh, I don't, it's not, it's not a silver bullet. You're not going to find... 10, 20 watts there. It is a few watts, but that's what makes the difference. That's that's what we were chasing. We're already in a very optimized scenario. Um, probably as you get onto the road and things are a bit more variable. It depends on the scenario. You may find a little bit more, a little bit less. It's definitely an improvement. Um, I expect you'll see a lot more of it out in the real world. Um, I imagine people start to look into different profiles, how they work with different rider leg shapes, different cadences. You know, as you can start to optimize these things to the nth degree, but the big win was from the implementation of them as a shape. And then there's obviously a more optimization you could do around the shape of that and how that works with that frame, that rider, et cetera. So I think you're probably the best person in the whole world to ask this. The, <coughs> our record is unified now. All the kind mm -hmm. of different, uh, well, what would you say, the different variants of the rule courtesy of um yeah Boardman the super superman position bike as well Graham Aubrey but Ghana's beat it now yep do you think it's ever going to be even attempted or beat now considering he kind of unified everything absolutely probably in the next two or three years you think someone's going to beat it I think someone will attempt it and I, I know of some people who can beat it as well it's it's not impossible. That's the thing. Like what he did was pretty epic. Obviously, he went a really long way in one hour. But Filippo is not superhuman. Like what he can do is capable of others if they're willing to commit. But you, it's not just a case of you can ride at the same power and let's say even on the road you had the same CDA as Filippo. That's two components. But the hour is significantly more complex than that. Hence why me, an athlete who probably, well, not really top 10 in the world TT, maybe I'd scrape a top 10 on a really, really good day. But not many of the guys who are finishing top 10 at world time trial could beat me in the hour record. So that step difference comes from the application of science and the understanding of demands of that event and how you need to optimize around it. And there's so much that we did that I'm pretty sure other teams either wouldn't know about or wouldn't know where to start because they, they don't have that history within track and the, and and the hour that Ineos has, or, or my background and my interest and my understanding of it either. And when we kind of applied that, we made a big leap forward in, in performance. I mean, from what I learned within the team, I found, yeah, 800 metres. And I, we probably found Filippo, at least that, maybe more. So I think people can do it, but they probably probably will be surprised at how hard it is as a challenge. But I don't, I don't think it's going to stand for decades, that's for sure. I think... People come along and they will they will beat it. Do you think Ghana can beat it? Like, improve on it? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. It wasn't his best ride. I think he'd put his hands up and say that. I think we're quite confident from our analysis in the team. There's there's more there. Use a scary thought. Do you think 60... We I asked you this before, but do you think 60 kilometres in one hour is doable? I've been asked this a few times. It's not I impossible. Was the first one. I was the first one. But it's so hard. So I, I would never say never. I'm not naive enough to claim there's some arbitrary limit because 60 kilometers is just a made up number when it comes down to it. Why not 60.1 or whatever it's, yeah, the number is kind of a bit irrelevant. So I think it can be beaten. I, I don't think we'd see 60 for, for decades, but it's not impossible. But for Filippo to go from where he went, I mean, quick numbers off the top of my head in the same conditions is like another 70 watts, maybe even a bit more, probably even a bit more than that. So you're talking somebody who can do an hour at north of 500 watts at a very good CDA. 
So what if you move it a higher altitude? It's more plausible at higher altitude. It's still not easy though when it comes down to it. It's you still got to ride up there. You still got to put out the I mean, altitude. Your saving still is significant, but you're not going to flip power altitude. Even if you put the same power out, I don't think he'd beat it. I think he'd still have to up his power ever so slightly. This is off the top of my head. I haven't got the spreadsheet fired up at the moment, but um, I don't think the improvement to go to say even like a a Cochabamba in Bolivia, which is 2,600, so even higher than than uh, Mexico, Aguascalientes, 2.6 from sea level, you maybe find 1.5K off the top of my head. So 58, 58 and a bit. But that's still a good way from 60. But yeah, Dan, moving on as well, of course, you're not just, uh, well, we haven't even spoken about that. Well, partially. Ineos Grandiers, performance yeah. engineer, uh, our record hunter, but you're also now a world champion in the track with the Team Pursuit team. Where did that kind of come from? Obviously, you have an amazing uh, background in Team Pursuiting, but uh, yeah, you weren't on the GDB team last year. <laughs> it's a really good question. Uh, I think Joss felt the same because it came literally six days after our wedding, seven days after six, seven days after our wedding. <laughs> So, so to kind of rewind the clock, back in March uh, was the was it March or was it April? No, it was March. The National Track Champs in Newport in the UK. Uh, they've been delayed actually because of COVID. I think I think they were meant to be in the Jan in January and they've been pushed back six weeks or eight weeks, something like that. Which is good because then I came to altitude, did a really good altitude block here in Andorra, and then went down because there was some terrible form in January. I got some good form by then. Rocked up and literally out of nowhere. And when I say out of nowhere, I mean, I didn't even think I was going to go that fast. Uh, rode a 405.2, which knocks like four and a bit seconds off the national record. And I think put me third fastest rider in history at that time behind Garner and Ashton. So it was like, yeah, quite a scary performance. I was like, shit, where did that come from? <laughs> like Probably like dumbfounded myself a little bit which is quite nice because i'd done so much prep and training around yeah tp our record stuff obviously done the hour but hadn't really like rolled it over into an ip and thought what could i actually do an ip or tried to so british hour record had been and gone in october 21 and then yeah it'd been sort of five six months and then i rocked up and did that and i was like gee that's pretty cool and yeah gb obviously got a bit interested and the plan was to trial me at the nation's cup in glasgow so I went back to the UK uh, just what, a week and a half before I managed to get COVID. Literally tested positive the morning I was due to travel up to Glasgow. So that put paid to do the Nations Cup and put, push things back really into Commie Games, I think it would have been. So I did, um, did a couple of sessions on track with them in Derby just when I was in the UK, just slot one in here or there. And then, yeah, I went to Commie Games. Didn't do a great performance to be honest in TPR IP. I really mistimed my altitude return to the point that I was, yeah, pretty, especially in the IP, I was horrific, really not good. Um, came good by the TT, obviously crashed out that, <laughs> um, and then went into the hour record. So figured out altitude and timing that's actually pretty important and never really had ended up in that bad window before. But anyway, I'd done a good enough performance that GB were interested in putting me in for the world champs for TP and IP. Had a really good block into that at altitude, came down from altitude, did a few training sessions at Derby, was going really well. Had a wedding, got married, <laughs> disappeared the following morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was really good at because we both had our our record bells at the altar. So instead of like wedding bells, because it was in Joss's parents' garden, instead of wedding bells, they were ringing the hour record bells. That was pretty cool. It was a really good wedding. Really, oh, really good wedding, a really good day, amazing day. Um, so many good memories. I, I properly, I did enjoy it. People are like, you're not going to drink. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm here to have a good time. It's my wedding. I'm doing it once. I'm not doing one again. I don't intend on. Uh, so, yeah, that that kind of um, maybe wouldn't have been an ideal prep. But the wedding, we planned it like a year out. And I never, ever, ever thought I'd be going to the World Track Champs. So that was um, a bit of a curveball to fit in. But Ben Greenwood, the head coach of GB, sorry, the men's endurance coach at GB, uh, was super supportive of the entire thing appreciative that i had my own plans for the year and we've got to work around that and i have a job and i live in another country there's a lot of kind of barriers to me 
fitting in with the team, but he's been awesome for it. And uh, yeah, so went to the world champs and we kind of glued really well as a team. I already knew a lot of the guys. Obviously, I worked with Ethan Hayter through Ineos and I've known him for many years, known Chazza. Actually, you know, Chazza didn't come. Well, he's, still, he's in the team, but he had COVID from a couple of weeks out and was feeling terrible, so he didn't end up joining us. Ethan Vernon was in what was Team KGF back in the day. So I've known Ethan for a good long while. Uh, and then Ollie Wood, who obviously I know of and have raced, raced against him plenty of times and going well. So it was, yeah, it was a really good team. Uh, we've done some fast times in Derby. We've gone 350.1, I think it was. And it was like, shit, we could have gone some 350 in Derby, which is mental because back when we were there as a rock bike, it was like, if you went to sub four there, like your mind exploded. It's like so fast because Derby is terribly slow track. So I kind of knew we were on in a really, really good place, probably more so than the other guys did, because I really appreciated how terribly slow Darvados can be. So when we got there and qualified fastest, so I mean, that though was like, yeah, something otherworldly. I mean, suddenly it was like, damn, we can actually compete for for the jersey here. I, I kind of thought, oh, maybe we'll be in a, in a fight for a medal if, if we go well. Maybe we're in a bronze medal fight or something like that. And, uh, yeah, so me and the... <laughs> Well, in the first round against the Kiwis, who they absolutely killed us in the Commie Games. They put two and a half seconds into us. So, yeah, to, to, to have the shoe on the other foot, as it were, and to, to really put them to the sword was, was quite nice because, I mean, they've got some amazingly strong guys, people like Aaron Gate, who are pulling absolutely silly turns. And, yeah, we, we had a relatively comfortable ride against them. And in the final, kind of juggled our strategy around a little bit. And then Ethan Hayter could be let off the leash, as it were, in the final kilo, because we kind of held him close. Uh, Ethan Vernon wasn't in a great place at that time, so we were making sure that he wasn't getting absolutely murdered. So then he was in, still recovering and still performing well each each pursuit. And then, yeah, we, we cut his turn down and Hayter got another half lap or so and basically got told, yeah, do what you need to do. And Ethan, you just got to hold on. And uh, yeah, Hayter did an absolute hero turn and just held off, well, held off Felipe, match Felipe for the final kilo, which was pretty epic. And we nipped it by two tenths, I think it was. So what's the goal? With so, being uh, so what's the team? goal? <laughs> I guess the goal is to win the Olympics, isn't it? It's some finished business. I mean, you were in the you were in the other seat in a way. You were helping Denmark trying to win the gold and then Ghana robbed us of that medal. <laughs> so uh, it's a pretty unique way to get into a team pursuit team that that you kind of carved out for yourself here? Yeah, I think well, we've had obviously a lot of discussions throughout that entire, like me working for the Danish period and yeah. to the Olympics and to the other side. So it's been an, an odd journey. I don't think any other athlete has worked for another nation to then come back and race against that nation and worked and also for one the, of the them third nation. Yeah. It's, it's a weird old dynamic. I totally appreciate that. But still... It's been, I wouldn't change it. I, I think it's made me who I am and I've thoroughly enjoyed every step of the process. Being with the Danes, like that was awesome. They helped me a lot as well. Not just, obviously I was there as an, as an employee, but they gave me a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't get elsewhere. And as an athlete as well, they enabled me to train with the world champions. Like how cool is that? They literally let me just drop in and <laughs> do team pursuiting with the world champs. It's absolutely nuts. Uh, so yeah, really, really thankful to them for what they gave me, and it, it's good to okay, yeah, I'm racing against them and like at Worlds to to shake hands with them afterwards, and I got really well, really, some really good friendships made there. So yeah, with the potential of racing Paris Olympics against against the Danes and against the Italians, who yeah, obviously through Filippo I work with as well. It's 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 not dynamic, but I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm very excited. I'm all in for it. That is the goal. There's no our records in the mid, in the middle ground. It's yeah, it's all in for for that. Well, thanks very much, Dan, for this. Uh, we could be here all evening, which I always appreciate. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a very exciting year, and to follow you with Ineos, obviously, but also with the track team. So uh, yeah, thanks for that, and of course, check out Dan on his Instagram as well and Twitter. Uh, but yeah, and his book as well, which is very good. Yeah, check out Start at the End. Maybe get a second one going after the Olympics. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you again, dude.